I'm going to do a little bit of context for everybody. So hi, everybody. <laughs> um, so this, this idea is kind of the fruition of a couple different ideas that came together at the same time. So the first thing is that um, we wanted to send Jonda off to her new adventure with a fond farewell um, and to get a chance for all of you to get together and wish her well. And, um, and Janet had graciously offered her space for a little barbecue and time for us to chat and relax and hang out with each other and tell stories. And um, through discussing that vision with Jonda and what she wanted to do for today, in addition to, in that discussion, we also talked about what's Arrow doing right now. And one of the things that Arrow um, has started to embark on just only in the last like six or eight weeks is um, discuss with the, um, the Montana Historical Society the prospect of donating um, an archiving collection for Arrow's history and their impact on the state um, for the last 40, almost 45 years. Um, and w without getting into too much detail, one of the reasons why we came to the conclusion that we wanted to do that in the, in the coming year or so is because the Arrow staff and the board got together and said, man, you know, every time I run into an Arrow board member from 20 years ago or a previous executive director or someone who was just, you know, a long-term member, we always come across these fascinating stories of things that Arrow has done in the past, relationships that Arrow has formed, the different ways that Arrow has impacted law in the state, and also practical application of sustainable agriculture and sustainable energy visions in the state. And, and we as a staff and as a current board didn't have firsthand knowledge of any of these stories. And so it was all like, it was as if we were learning about ourselves all over again. And, um, and then we knew we had this huge collection of papers and videos and this like radio commentary, radio commentary all, this, all, of this, all of these artifacts of things that a lot of this group helped make real conference proceedings and and they were all sitting in filing cabinets in the back of the office and it's our vision that we co recollect these stories from all of you as those who helped bring them to fruition bring them to reality and then pair those oral histories with the archives with the help of the historical society to help organize that collection mm -hmm. into something that the public can peruse into something that Arrow as an organization can call, recall and call back on and use at, um, as a way to forge our future, you know, to look back at all of the great work that, we, that Arrow has done, look back at all of the relationships that all of you helped to, to nourish for four decades and to make sure that it doesn't just get lost in, in a filing cabinet with dust on it, right? So, um, so this is our, our first attempt to try to really collect those stories from all of you. It, and it's not just about like a timeline and what did we do, but it's those personal stories, right? It's, um, it's hearing about Jane and her garlic, right? Like for me, that was a really meaningful thing this spring was to listen to a story of um, stewarding um, seeds throughout generations of Arrow's family, right? Um, and I know that there's more of those, and every time I interact with one of you, um, I hear them, and so I, I don't want them to be lost. I want them to be saved, and I want them to be spoken by your voices. And so um, I think that nothing but goodness will come from that for Arrow. Um, and I'm really, really grateful that all of you are willing to sit down and chat a little bit about what it was like. Who was in your world while you were a staff member, while you were helping to run the show? That, that could, the idea is that each one of you have stories that will help us hone a particular era for, for Arrow, right? Um, and, and so I, I think that that's what we're hoping to get out of this collection of stories. Does that make sense?
my, I met some of the people, I, I've heard the stories of the people that formed Arrow, and it was on the porch of Kai Cochran's aunt or um, cousin who had a ranch in the Powder River country, which in 1974 was looking at massive strip mining and, um, you know, many coal-fired power plants. And so anyway, a group of people that wanted to not just be organizing to fight against all that development, um, decided to figure out to say yes to something, and that turned out to be renewable energy and smart energy policies and using the sun and the wind to, uh, instead of coal, to go forward. And one of the first things that group did, which Wilbur and Elizabeth will talk about, is, is formed a traveling roadshow to promote those ideas. Um, so some of the early people that you need to get talked to are Kai and John Brown and um, some people that were already mentioned that were, in, and Wilbur and Elizabeth that were in those early meetings. So I think it was 1980, 1984, I went to work for the governor as the agriculture aide. And somebody at Arrow kind of figured out that, um, you know, somebody in the governor's office who's focused on agriculture might be a good speaker for the annual meeting. So the annual meeting was at the fairgrounds out in Helena. Um, there were maybe 25 people there. And um, I don't, I probably have that speech somewhere, but I don't remember what I said. <laughs> but, um, that, that was my introduction to Arrow. And after the formalities were over at that annual meeting, um, I think it was Dave Oyen said, well, let's, let's organize an agriculture task force of Arrow. So we're not just looking at renewable energy, but you know, there's a lot of interest in sustainable agriculture as well. So um, that's, my, uh, that was my entree and I guess some influence um, in terms of Arrow broadening its uh, area of interest. Um, and I know that the, on the energy side, the renewable energy side, the story I heard, because I wasn't part of that, but um, that uh, the DNRC started to do the work that Arrow had been promoting. And so, you know, it was sort of a sign of success that Arrow, you know, started this um, move towards renewable energy and then it got institutionalized in state government. And so that's when Arrow started looking at what do we, you know, what else do we do next? And it was sustainable agriculture. I was hired as the first sustainable ag staffer for Arrow in late summer of 84 to help organize the first sustainable agriculture conference. And um, at the time, someone described the transition from renewable energy to sustainable agriculture of simply uh, uh, enabling farmers to make better use of sunlight than they had to this point, <laughs> and um, through diversified cropping systems and the like. And there's a lot of people who were involved in, in the genesis of this. Bob Quinn, Jim Barngrover, Russ Salisbury, a whole bunch of folks who aren't in this room who kept coming to the table to not only influence policy, but at a practical level, try to even influence the university's agenda. Um, and what the Department of Ag's direction might be and, 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 and sort of fill the gap that clearly the university and public agencies weren't willing and what we found out even capable of doing uh, in terms of creating the space for farmers to experiment and whatnot and, and to support one another in the types of changes that they saw being necessary to make their own operations sustainable, both at an environmental and economic level. But I almost, w I would like to indulge everybody here and skip ahead to what some of that resulted in. If 
Bob Quinn, who's sitting in this room, called me the summer of 1990 and said, do you know what our state director of agriculture just called organic farming? He said it was a fraud. And um, within a decade or so, the State Department of Agriculture was certifying organic farms in this state. Um, Montana State University, years and years ago, stretched a little bit in terms of what they said they were going to do. And we said, why don't you change your research agenda to include not only to benefit conventional farmers, but all farmers who wanted to do something different than uh, raise wheat and barley and sell it to the grain elevators. They gamely tried. There were some excellent researchers in the early days who said, yes, what sustainable agriculture and organic farming present is a whole set of researchable questions that we'd like to tackle. Now, Montana State University is going to be the new host institution for the Western SARE Sustainable Agriculture Research and Education wow. Grants Program. And, and they also have a goal at the experimental stations to have organic, designated organic plots and maybe even fields. I, I heard just yesterday at the field day in Haver, Northern Research Station, that the Moccasin Research Station has, I believe, 25 acres set aside mm -hmm. for organic research. Right, right. And the, the circles, that circle is just about closed. The Western Sarah Governing Board for this region is going to be at the Moccasin Station the end of next month to see what that's looking like. Mm -hmm. So if, for those of us who remember those dark days when Everett Snortland was calling organic farming a fraud, <laughs> or the university was trying, going, bending over backwards to not put this on their agenda, we have to recognize that time was on our side. Al, do you remember what Gene May said at that last meeting with MSU? Gene said, well, I guess all these conversations have sort of told us what you can't do and tells us what we have to do. Mm. Hi, audience out there, this is a perfect example of how they're old. <laughs> Okay, Joan Dunn, you have been an inspiration, and, and you were my main coach when I would come to Helena to testify for all kinds of stuff, mostly anti-GMO stuff, but some uh, positive things like um, organic whatever we're trying to promote. And I'll never forget uh, coming over the, um, uh, the, the mountain, the past, out of the past, and the, when my telephone would reconnect, with you in the office, and I was usually running a little late, and uh, trying to put together the last touches on on um, the testimony, and I, I think it was a GMO subject this time. And so Jonah was on the phone with me, and I said, well, oh no, no, I think it was, uh, it was might have been GMO, but it was a negotiation with grain growers. And Jonah said, and I said, you know, I'm always trying to compromise and get something to happen and bring people to the middle and so we can at least go an inch or two every year. And Jonah says, we've already compromised enough with these guys. <laughs> and, so, <laughs> and so I took her at her word and uh, we plowed through with what our plans were and uh, what, the plans that we had made and it was successful. And that was just one example and uh, I usually followed her advice because I found it to be quite sound and so I have brought you a little token of my appreciation out of my yard. This is adding value. <laughs> so oh. this is for you. Of course they're organic. Of course they're organic. But you're, we gotta get your. Oh, I'm on the I'm on the wire. Oh man, it's just like. <laughs> what's that there show? There we go. Well, anyway, as soon as Jonah gets back. So Jonah, that's just the beginning. Uh oh. Boy. So I knew you were going to. Um, let's see. I knew you were. Are you retiring? What are you doing? <laughs> okay. Well, anyway. You're, but you're you're going clear across the country. Yes, I am. I, I, these, everything is from Big Sandy here. This is from Ezzy's Wholesale, and it's a small calendar. <laughs> <laughs>
and you can stick that right. on your bicycle, <laughs> uh, on your car, whatever you're doing. Now, um, I want you to make sure that you uh, are living a clean life there in uh, Pennsylvania when you move from, Mo yes, from Montana, because where we have clean air and all that stuff. So I brought you a, your very own bar of soap Ooh, from the oil barn. Oil barn. Smells good. And, uh, adding value. That's right. And speaking of adding value, oh. if you want popcorn this winter, Oh, this is the best oil for popcorn. I know that. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> I usually have to fight over this at the MOA conference. Yeah. <laughs> Montana Organic. Yeah, Jim, Jim was, uh, he's always got his eye on that oil bottle at the MOA conference. And my, and my and that's right. And this is my last gift of a little, your very own Ooh. box of snacks. Ooh. And don't eat them all at once because it's a long ways back to get so. the next bottle. But you will, we, do the, we do mail order. <laughs> okay. can ship to pencil crack and canoe. Yes. Making a commercial here. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and, and my own um, original box, I'll have to save that a few years, so it'll be valuable also. Someday. Well, and yes, not because only what's in it. it's going to be changing. Uh, so that even makes oh, it more oh, valuable. This is an heirloom box. Yes, it will be. Yes, <laughs> yes. Vintage. Thank you. Vintage. Yes, <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Bob. You can call that the first one. So anyway, thank I you. appreciate that very And um, thanks for all you've done to help promote organic and arrow and everything else in Montana. It's been well, I mean, great. Your, your, your profile on there, or your face, it could be like the, Chir uh, the Cheerios and Ted Williams. Yeah. <laughs> Ted Williams. Yeah. Right. Oh, you yeah. think? Well, that's great. Okay, I'm glad I brought my hat. Yes, okay, well, John Tester and I, I get, you guys know uh, John and I live across the tracks from each other. He's on one side of the tracks. He claims I'm on the other side of the tracks. Um, <laughs> And we served on the school board together. It was John's very first um, kind of sticking his toe into politics and my very last. So, <laughs> and uh, that's how that went. But um, we worked together real close on that to get the um, principal fired, who had retired some years behind, before, but was still drawing a, a salary, and um, was absolutely doing nothing. We finally ended up eliminating his job the Civil Liberties Union filed suit against us for age discrimination, and we had a great, great fun together. <laughs> but um, this guy, anyway, I don't want to get into that story. That's John and I's story. But anyway, John ended up in the legislature, and and um, in the early uh, or mid, I guess mid mid eighties, right? About the time I started into organic. Late nineties. Late nineties. In the legislature. Yeah. yeah. John was on the board in ninety. Okay, well, when did we first, okay, okay, that's right. Okay, it was Al that was working on the first um, uh, organic, standards. organic standards thing. That's right. John and I worked on the, uh, on the labeling law. John and I, in the 90s, that's why I got mixed up. John and I worked on the um, certification for Montana. That thing, that's what we worked on. And we would sit in the, um, uh, we sat in the cafe or the bar there at the, um, uh, after a conference or a meeting or something in the um, uh, the hotel that Babcock used to have, what was that hotel? Colonial. The Colonial, Colonial Inn, Inn. Yeah. yeah. And we wrote that out on the back of a napkin. And, and that wasn't the only time that John and I wrote out our ideas in the back of a napkin. And I think it's really neat that you start in the back of a napkin and become law eventually. So I don't know if he's still doing that, but... Um, <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we should go back to that. Paper now. Yeah, it's yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's really jumping ahead, Joan. <laughs> Joan, that's really jumping. Anyway, um, Al called me. I was on my way back from California, I think. What year was that, Al? We were working on that labeling law. And you called. Yeah, and I was on my way back from the first show that I'd ever been to California, and I ended up in, in Helena. And Al called me to see if I could come and help testify, and I think you'd already, the, the law was on the way through the legislature. And that was the first time we had met. Right, and we met at a, a, a strip mall here in Helena, and Bob had come from the Anaheim trade show, and he opened this oh, yeah. suitcase full of stuff, of all different fluorescent colors and whatnot, and he said, you wouldn't believe what people in California buy and what they're thinking about these. <laughs> that was my first introduction. Right, right. Yep. And now you see my uh, colors and everything. I think some of it rubbed off. But that was my first uh, introduction to Arrow, really. And um, we're off and running with that labeling law. And we're, one of the, I think, the third state, maybe, to get that uh, established in, in the whole country. And that was pretty, um, that was pretty neat. 
Um, it was it was really almost before its time. We didn't have a lot of organized opposition, as I remember. They were mostly ignoring us. They couldn't hardly believe that it was going to amount to anything anyway. And um, I don't think we had too much bother, did we, with that? When that went through. Um, what did the labeling law say? Well. Standard. Yeah, so we had some standards. It was a three-year standard. California was only two at the time. So we had up them by one year, and actually three became the standard for the country and, and the world now. But uh, we were one of the first up the California standard to three years um, by a state. And um, that enabled Montana then to have a definition, and then if you sold something in Montana labeled organic, it meant something. Well, who all? Um, I didn't initiate that. But the growers were interested. In yes, there was there were some growers that were already doing organic. There was just a, fall, a small group. Um, Dave Moyen was certainly involved. Right, Jim, right. Jim, and then the guy, the chicken guy, from down the road. Um, what's his name? Gene. Yeah. Gene yeah, May. Gene May. He was there really early, and and then who else? Oh, Craig Clyde well, was involved. Oh, that's right. Then, so right. the farmers. Were and yeah, Sally Brown. And, yeah. Yeah. and soon after that, I had met Tom Harding and um, Fred Kirschman, yeah. invited them to Montana. They got invited to Montana to speak at Bozeman at a, at a meeting, and we talked to both of them. Both of them had competing certification organizations. <laughs> Tom was with OCIA and Fred was with uh, FEO, Verified Organic, Farm Verified, Farm Verified Organic, and there was OCI Organics um, uh, Crop Improvement Association. And we invited them both to Montana to see which way Montana was going to go because the CODIS were very strong FEO. And Tom told a very strong story for um, OCIA. And we, in the meantime, we formed um, OCAM. And there was Many of you guys. Yeah. Okay, OCAM was <laughs> Organic. Certification okay. Association of Montana. Yeah, okay, Organic <laughs> Certification Association yeah. of Montana. And at that time, we hadn't decided which group we we're going to go with, and we were thinking about maybe doing our own or something. We didn't know what we we're going to do, but we did. We did know we had a, a need and a common interest, and about a dozen or so of us came together. Huh? Yeah. It was about a dozen of us, oh. and we met here in Helena and. Didn't Arrow kind of sponsor that, or they were helping with that yeah. effort? And then at a certain point, um, the group I was working with, uh, farmers, and I had started my flour mill by that time, so I was buying some organic grain from some uh, group in north central Montana, and we decided to go with Tom Harding and OCIA. And so we peeled off a oak. Uh, which stands for Organic Crop Improvement Association. <laughs> this time I got it. And um, so we peeled off um, of our really active roles in OCAM and, um, and started OCIA uh, Club uh, yeah. Chapter, that's what it's called. And um, then there was, by the time that ended, there were four chapters in the state, I think. Mm -hmm. And then OCAM uh, continued to exist. I think, and then evolved eventually into uh, MOA, yeah. sort of. Yeah. Yeah. Um, when the state took over yeah, when the state took over certification, then all of a sudden, well, um, what's her name, the vegetable gal over in Kalispell? Judy. Judy Osowitz. She was, we were going around doing um, hearings from the state. Uh, this was after the law had been passed, enabling legislation had been passed. And Judy was one of the first ones that stood up and said, we need a marketing arm, we need an association of farmers. And she was very strong on that. And, um, and so afterwards I said, well, Judy, you are so strong on this. Um, I think you should take the lead on this. <laughs> and I don't know what, I think it was an arrow conference in, it, um, at the um, hot springs at um, just north of Yellowstone, what's it called, which one's that? Chico. 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 Wasn't that an arrow meeting? Oh, yes, it was. And so Judy and I were in the hot tub uh, hot springs. Hot springs. Hot springs. <laughs> the Mom, big one. The that. big one. The big one. <laughs> right next to the pool. Right next to the pool. And um, 
<laughs> Let's see, who else? There was somebody else here. Oh, the gal that's the certification leader gal. Margaret? Margaret. Margaret, Margaret Scholes. The three of us. And by the time we got done steaming, we had um, put together an idea for MOA and having the first conference in Great Falls. And that was another spin-off of Arrow, really. And Arrow was sort of the big speaker for so many things that happened organically in Montana. And that's what I think the story needs to bear out. Um, Nancy's, uh, I don't know if you talked about the, 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 um, the farm improvement clubs. No, not yet. We had, um, we jumped on that in our in Big Sandy. John was a, a group in that, Bob Vester. <laughs> Um, and I and a couple others, and we had a lot of fun with that. And uh, we would meet at each other's home every week until we got close to harvest, <laughs> and then it sort of disbanded. <laughs> but um, uh, and serve each other breakfast and tell stories and go out and look at each other's fields. And, and I remember my was my favorite meeting, but the most memorable one was I was breaking on my um, clover that was all coming up as a green manure under. With spring wheat or something. And so we had breakfast. This is the middle of June. And we went out to look at the clover all coming up. I said, it's a beautiful sand. It's just perfect, solid, everything. And we went out and got out of the pickups and walked out in the field. And there wasn't a single plant of clover anywhere to be found. <laughs> because the year before was a clover year where the whole prairie was yellow with clover. The weevil population built up in the oh. wild clover. And the next year, they didn't have anything neat because the wild clover usually crashes mm -hmm. the second year and there's almost nothing grows. But I planted it at my house and they all came to my house. <laughs> <laughs> and they ate off every single one. And we could, if you got on your hands and knees, you could see the little stems oh. left. And that's all that was left. Oh. And um, anyway, that was the end of my show and tell. <laughs> so much for all you. Yeah, I know. <laughs> anyway, but that was a, it, I would, some of those lessons. I really prefer to learn in private, but <laughs> that was sort of a public lesson I didn't expect. But uh, but that was a spin-off of the farm um, improvement clubs, and Nancy really was involved with. But Arrow again was an incubator of many, many of those things. The Ag Task Force had been having uh, bi-monthly meetings and conversations about how to tackle, you know, how to learn how to do sustainable agriculture. And um, Al, you had the idea of organizing groups, and you know we were gonna like travel around and organize groups at churches and stuff. And I suggested that we instead offer a financial um, incentive. So they had, so we set up a small grant program that was funded by the Jesse Smith Noise Foundation. Mm -hmm. Um, and the, the Helena Area Lutheran Church. Um, I forget what they call that organization. It wasn't like the congregation, but the synod, the Lutheran synod um, kicked in. So we could offer small grants, and we required there to be at least four other farmers, I think? Four or five, yeah. So that they would be learning, you know, with each other, and they had to write a proposal about what they wanted to experiment with and how they were going to do it. And we had a competitive process to choose which ones, and it had to be farmers because we could see that extension agents were going to start putting in applications. It was like it all has to be farmers. But you were brilliant around making sure they had the technical provider, which was a university person or an extension person, so that we were educating them and moving them along. Well, the farmers were. Mm -hmm. And we didn't have to do it. So that was like, I thought that was a great move. And that became the template for the national, I don't know if every region does it, but Western SARE waited to see how, they didn't want, they modeled their farmer rancher grant program after that. That mm -hmm. farmers had to be the originators of the grant. But a technical advisor had to either learn or teach in some capacity. Probably both. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and the, the program got enough um, visibility that DNRC, who gives grants to individuals, um, but they thought, you know, this thing with 
a group and reporting out what each group learned. So the NRC copied it. Um, as well as um, two Canadian provinces, and there were like five different states um, that adopted and adapted the Twelve in all <laughs> of your model. The, the, the model that was created in Montana was used in 12 other places around the country and in Canada. The well, two in Canada and ten wow. in the United States, not counting Sarah, which then, of course, used it in all regions of the country. Mm -hmm. well, wasn't it originally an extension model anyway? That we it was. It was. It was Actually, Farm um, Bureau. Pete, no, Farm, it? Farm Bureau started it was in the Midwest. Farm Bureau. But Pete Peterson, who was a soil conservationist, uh, the state soil conservationist, he's the one who said, um, you know, we, he was on the Ag Task Force, and he said, Let, you know, let's just do this, you know, through Arrow. So lots of different kinds of people, and you know, that's, to me the beauty of Arrow is the brilliance of individuals coming together and multiplying, you know, by exponentially. What were some of the major outcomes? And I think it would be a really nice time to share this then with Jim, who's seen a lot of that. And certainly Bob saw a lot of that. Yeah, like what did we field. learn from the farm club experience? And, and what were some of those really significant outcomes in Al as well? Well, you know, I mean, the staff wrote up the stories. There, we would get the, all the clubs together annually so they could report to each other. And there were a lot of farmers who'd never spoken in front of a crowd before. So it was leadership development as well as um, then cross learning. And other people who weren't part of the farm improvement clubs started to want to come and, and hear because of what they were learning. And they were learning a ton. So um, we the, the grant required them to write a report. So they're collected, those reports are collected in the in our office. With Nancy on the Farm Improvement Club work. Um, and we had, actually we had the smart growth program in there too, and the <laughs> which we never talked about. Uh, yes, and I was going to go into food systems. So I remember um, at one point we had been doing all these ag practices, and the movement was really going toward um, marketing and um, retail and creating value added products, like Bob talks about. And I remember at a meeting, Russ Salisbury said, I mean, he was very quiet through the whole meeting, and we we're sort of going on and on about, well, what's the next step, and how should we take this, and where should we take it? And Russ said, eat arrow. <laughs> <laughs> I said, excuse me? <laughs> he said, eat arrow. And, and, we, and we sort of became, oh. So we we're sort of a community to really think about how to move agriculture much more broadly than just practices. And um, certainly you, Nancy, were really active in um, the whole Kellogg network, um, moving the food systems concept from the ag practice concept. And um, so it started out as integrated ag practices, and then it went into food systems. And I really believe that Arrow at that point with a lot of your leadership, clearly a lot of your leadership, was at the cutting edge of what Kellogg was looking for in terms of moving those issues much broader into the community. And for me, it was just such an exciting time to be at Arrow because there was money, there was energy, there was connection nationally with people really thinking well about how to create a new economy, how to market, how to move this food into, into a broader group of people. So it was, and there was money. It's <laughs> worth saying. And, I, and, I, yes. and, I, and, and so it was this very rich time where I think we really felt like, wow, we're leaders in this national movement. And um, I remember we set the, we set the record for how fast you could get a grant from Kellogg. Because they always took at least a year, and we put together a grant that turned around and sent us the money in one month. So they were like saying, you know, go. Um, we trust you. 
you know what you're doing. Um, and a lot of that had to do with the board, which is pretty incredible, but Nancy's leadership. One day, uh, she'd heard that Montana was doing kind of an arrow or doing amazing things related to local food. And so I started to talk about cooking oil and meat, and she said, well, no, I just mean vegetables. <laughs> and I said, well, you know, Arrow is looking at the whole array of food. Anyway, she hung up. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it, didn't, it didn't fit her world view. Yeah, she, she wrote a, 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 a paragraph or two in support of the Linda Lemon Run. Ah. Okay. So, and the the other thing is that that the whole the whole language around food systems was about local, and then there got to be these debates about well, is it a hundred mile radius or is it fifty? And Arrow was using the term community based food systems, and Kellogg adopted that because it, you know, that's what it's about. Whether you're in the Philippines or in Montana, it's about the structure of the food system. Um, not how close or far. I'm going to pass it to Jim, but I'm going to shortstop it to say this much. Um, now, 15 or 20 years later, Montana is number rated by local wars, whoever they are, so the group back <laughs> east, as number three in the country as far as moving along the farm to cafeteria agenda. Oh, wow. So that was just announced last month. I, I think that that part of this happened because it was before the age of the internet and email. Um, I, I distinctly recall in the 80s and even well into the 90s, the Ag Task Force in, in particular, which uh, was a group of, of many of us here and, and others, um, would meet three, maybe four times a year, and we would travel, uh, many of us, several hundred miles, maybe more, to meet. And that isn't happening these days. I mean, there are other ways of meeting, but meeting face-to-face -face and spending uh, at least a day and maybe overnight and two days, it, it was a different era. Uh, things happened a little differently, and there was more intimacy. And that was particularly, I think, important to really committing ourselves to what we were talking about. Um, and, and in addition to that, uh, and still to this day, Arrow has its annual meeting or expo. We move it around. It's not in the same place every year. It's moved from, uh, well, virtually all over the state. Um, and, and I think back to those, um, many of those occasions at the annual meeting uh, <clears throat> where there's been very special events and people really connecting in a uh, deep, uh, special way. One thing that I think Arrow, sort of reflecting on and probably thinking ahead as well is Arrow has always been perilous in a perilous position in part compared to many well-heeled organizations in part because it's out on the cutting edge and then the rest of the world catches up with it and there's no reward for remaining like everybody else because they're doing what they should have been doing some time ago. So that creates sort of an odd place for an organization to reside and survive because uh, I remember when this, this um, the sustainable agriculture stuff was very new and my job was to figure out how to package and sell it to foundations and they didn't get it. It took the funding world quite a while to catch up with the organization. So it may be something that maybe Arrow won't face it forever but it certainly has. So my memories of Arrow is first in the 80s, you know, when everything was going fine, and then the 90s where it was sliding a little bit, and then in 2000 when I got on the board, it slid into a deep hole. So <laughs> a lot of my memories are in just the things that had to get done, and it was tough. And the thing that amazed me most about Arrow is how the staff and the board wants to that one staff was removed. How the staff and the board worked so well together, and I've never seen such cooperative, you know, cooperation and working as a team that was really strong, and it would, it, you know, it impressed me. And I feel like the nature 
of ARO is that, that we work together, both staff and board, as a unit, and pulled it all out and started flying again. That's what it takes, and then we hired Joan, and that really, really helped. <laughs> so what do you think, moving forward, what, um, what can be learned from the past for the present, for the future? That's a really good question. I think the building of community mm -hmm. and networking aspect of what Arrow does is to, to work on that. And, you know, like Jim said, the internet and social media has kind of separated us in, you know, physically, but some of the younger people think that that's, that's enough. But I think the face-to-face -face community building things in the small communities and then coming together once a year is really important. We've got to keep the spirit going. I would say um, don't be afraid to be a little weird <laughs> and, and to be a little out there and to really take risk um, and um, ask those really weird and stupid questions. I mean, I think Arrow just is continually learning and not being afraid to look different or um, have a different vision. So that's, that's what I really appreciate. I think that one thing that's really critical in the future is to maintain something that many have said already, and that's diversity. And we were very, very diverse, as we know. And if we can keep that, um, welcome that open to all kinds of uh, sections that might wander into our door, I think that will only strengthen Arrow in the future. Those great accomplishments that came out of the 80s, you know, policy changing, other people adopting the models. You had um, act, an active membership and you had people that were involved in, you know, in, in farming and agriculture. So they were business, you know, in a way they were business people that policy was directly affecting their life. When you get in a policy that's not tied to your work or your life, it's harder for volunteers to be focused. You know, we had we did the the smart growth program developed when I was getting involved on the board, and we actually another outcome. We had what in the end four statewide conferences on sprawl and land use, and um, very well, very excellent conferences of you know national speakers and thinkers and whatnot and that was put on by a co smart growth coalition that came out of Arrow smart growth I mean we really staffed that organization for the first you know through Margaret Lincoln probably for the first two years I think and Margaret did all the work on that first conference oh, pretty Paul much Reichert. and Paul Reichert right he and when I came in when I got on the Paul was on staff with that program before Margaret was yes yeah. so that was really important and so I think in thinking about going forward, you know, the five people that would drive 200 miles to spend a weekend talking about something that has a direct impact on either state policy or national policy, or a model of how nonprofits are struggling to motivate people in a way that's just not wasting our time or being asked for money or whatever, but it's exciting to us and creative. I mean, that's always been the glue, you know, and and I, I feel like it's, it hasn't quite gelled who the membership is right now and where people have, there's a lot of entrepreneurs in the membership who are getting a lot of help in becoming you know, small business people in the food systems work, which didn't exist 20 years ago. My first real, you know, going in deep with this beyond visiting the office when I had my office above and stealing all your magazines, because <laughs> they were so interesting, was, was the, um, the community food systems study group we did so that was was must have been funded by and we had these local groups around the state and we spent six to eight weeks with this curriculum on what you know learning what food systems were that was and I was really interested in sustainability at the time I was getting involved in land use planning and to me that was like such a key uh, help to for me thinking about what I was trying to do and you know there was money to do it to make it happen but somehow these kind of things motivate people and get them fired up to do that extra mile, you know, on policy work and stuff, which is coming and testifying. So, you know, there's certainly enough out there that needs 
creativity applied to it in our world today. You know, we've come so far, and it's been mentioned about the, the um, staff at Montana State University, the Western SARE, the experimental stations, and on a level of being involved in a business that um, contracts with organic growers for pulse crops and ancient grains. Uh, every year we're seeing more and more people that are converting to organic agriculture um, that have, um, have philosophical and economic roots uh, or, or uh, motivation for the conversion. And um, I, I, it's just so gratifying to be working with people that I'd never met before um, that, that are willing to take risk because they, they believe there's got to be a better way that their family members or themselves have incurred uh, injury from exposure to uh, agricultural chemicals and they don't want to go down that path anymore. And that the conventional uh, markets are very predatory and this year looks to be uh, like it's going to be perhaps an all-time record uh, crop for winter wheat, but we probably are going to see exceedingly low prices for that winter wheat. You can't produce yourself out uh, or, or create a profit by outproducing what your inputs are. And the organic agriculture is based on a very different model. And I think Arrow has played a very significant role in changing a lot of people's mind that are looking at a better way of farming and a more sustainable way and a brighter future. Um, I just, I guess I'm reminded of a question I always have when I think about nonprofit work and whether it all feels like this, and I don't think it does, and I, I mean that in um, the way that Arrow is its people. Um, and when Jen Hill Hart hired me, I had no experience in nonprofits. I came in and like quoted Wendell Berry and cried a little, and she cried a little, and she was like, "Okay, I'm gonna hire you." <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it's very Arrow. It's very Arrow, and she she would always say, you know, Arrow is its stories, and Arrow is really touchy feely, which is true. Um, but I just I don't think that other organizations sort of feel this way, and that that they are their people um, and that they are so tied to those stories and those roots and that's why people come and stick around for so long and that's why people show up at an arrow meeting and then keep coming back and coming back and think that we're just the craziest coolest people <laughs> around because you are um, so yeah I just I just am reminded how much these stories are what really matter and what really move me and I think keep people in this circle and and drawn towards arrow and all of its quirkiness because it is quirky and I think Pam's right we shouldn't afraid to be afraid to remember that we're quirky and we're sort of out on the edge um, so thanks everybody it was really nice to hear all this hi Robin one more really mm -hmm. short thing to say about um, <laughs> going into the lion's den <laughs> don't ever be afraid to go into the lion's den I remember Al Kirky signed and this is really early on in organic era signed up with Farm Bureau for a booth at their convention. <laughs> <laughs> and one of the stipulations was that we uh, got a speaker slot. Uh -huh. And Al called me up and said, guess what, you're the speaker slot. <laughs> <laughs> and, and they didn't give us a very big room, but when we got to the time for that presentation, it was standing room only. Uh -huh. And before the end, the state president for Montana brought in the national president to uh, sit through the, he didn't get to in there for the whole thing, but probably the last third or last half of the presentation, which I thought was quite amazing. Mm -hmm. And it's way further than I would have pushed, um, but it turned out to be very successful, didn't it, Al? That was in, I forgot what year that was, but. Well, actually, I had just left Arrow and went to work for NCAP, which is a little more well heeled. <laughs> oh, <laughs> was that was for NCAP that you right, did that? Right, okay, right. I did. Three, three job fairs. Okay, yeah, right, right. okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Anyway, that was that was a typical arrow type thing, though. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> uh, that, was, that he, he I, did. So. I would call Bob and say, Bob, if to get a session, uh, th they're insisting that we pay for a copy. What do you think? Because I didn't know what the hell was going on. He said, Let's go for it. <laughs> <laughs> and, money. and Farm Bureau was like, they kept trying to find a way to say no, <laughs> but you, in fact, kept finding a way to say yes, and I could actually write checks. Yeah. <laughs>
It was a great team. <laughs> I was really struck by the ask the weird and the stupid questions. One takeaway is I think that we need, con we need to think about that in terms of our process. And my question to you guys, though, given your history, is I'd be curious to know what you think is the next weird or stupid question to ask with respect to organic mm -hmm. and, and where Arrow can go. Because mm -hmm. you have a whole lot more history with the evolutionary process than the current staff and board, really. Well, there's also Richard Wrench's raspberries and his garlic. And I still have, I have a farm improvement club apple tree in my yard. And it's like all these relics are actually living relics yes. um, <laughs> from Arrow. Uh, one thing I wanted that really struck me about Arrow about six years ago when it was going through some really difficult time, the, um, the board brought some of us together to really think about you know, where's Arrow going and what's important and what it did for you. And my big takeaway from that is every person in the room, Arrow's life had changed. And it had put them on a certain path, particularly for their career or work. And um, when I looked at this room of about probably 20 people, everyone had that story that it was life-changing for me. And I think thinking about how to engage people in ways that are life-changing for them is a way to think about strategy for Arrow. Mm -hmm. Because that was the glue that <laughs> all kept it. You know, no pressure. <laughs> but it, it just sort of happened. I mean, I wouldn't be on this path. I mean, we, none of us would be on this path, I think, that we're on without Arrow. So mm -hmm. that was pretty incredible. Right. We all grew up. And then coming back to Montana, people on the land. Um, and today, it's, you know, I that's more more important than ever but you know w w I don't think people thought it up ahead of time they found themselves together around coal destruction coal mining destruction and the inability to farm the way you wanted to farm and then later kind of how does that affect community and how we eat right right so there's so many things there's there's so many things about community i mean calling it a sustainable community it maybe is a mistake because we get hung up on what that might mean and our community is having a hard time finding safe places in which to try to influence the larger culture and um so if that's a hunger arrow is a perfect place to actually turn that into you know, change. I mean, I didn't, John Tester's name came up. When I went on the board, John Tester was treasurer of the Arrow board. When he left to run for office, I became treasurer of Arrow, maybe to its detriment, because <laughs> when Arrow got in difficulty after two um, unsuccessful hires that were quite painful for everybody involved, um, I ended up being interim director having been treasurer and spent most of my time trying to figure out where we were on our spreadsheets and financial. And it was a lot of reasons, it was complicated, but um, I strayed a little bit. This, my point is that those moments are gonna come and hopefully they don't come the way they came for us, which is, you know, we can tell some other time, but you know, you guys are sitting there and there's a lot of people that are spending a lot of time frustrated, confused, angry, you know, uh, flaring off, that energy could be put to creative use in, okay, you don't like the community the way it is now? Let's, let's make it work for us. You know, and there's gazillions of projects. Thank you for all, to hear all of you talk about, like, look, this wasn't a singular path to success, like, there were bumps along the way, there were failures, <laughs> and the, the way you get 45 years down the road is to endure them and to learn from them mm -hmm. and to talk about them and to like share with just as much openness um, as you can failures as well as successes so that you know you can learn from them and that others can learn from them. And I, it's, it's, um, it's, it's a good thing for us to remember as humans, but it's also good for Arrow to remember as an organization, right? That mm -hmm. there are bumps and turns along the way and unexpected things that 
that come along and you, the adaptability of the organization is what keeps it thriving. There have been at least three crises, I think, in the organization, <laughs> probably more, in yeah. terms of financial. Do we want to give them the mic? Or <laughs> I, 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 that's what I meant. Very briefly uh, say that, that when I was on the board in the mid-'80s, uh, Al Kirky, uh, I think it was on his first year of being the um, project, project manager, I forget the title, um, but we have literally ran out of money and if it hadn't been for board members digging into their pockets and saying, we need this, we want you to continue to do what you're doing, we believe in this, we wouldn't probably exist today. It was that kind of commitment that kept Arrow afloat through the difficult time. 